And then had a second dream that kind of informed this incredible theater of, of politics. So the dream said, gather the women and pray for peace. You did picketing and fasting and praying, which is all very religious and spiritual. You used Bible quotes as clues to what you should do next, to making your own decisions. Uh, you brought together Christians and Muslims. Do you think the Nobel had an effect on the Liberian women involved? I think there is a sort of ripple effect. It, it had, there was that moment of excitement, moment of, you know, just that moment of wow, you know, and I think where we are, the president and I, is seizing that moment and really translating it into good for girls and boys. And that's why with the foundation, the scholarship is a very important part for me. Say a word about because um, education is life. And Ruth, when I said that AJWS has opened a new, when we started the Girls Project in 2007, with the first funding of $20,000 $20, from AJWS, we went into communities where girls had never really dared to go to college. By the time we got through working with the first group of girls in Bonn and Basel, some of them were coming to Monrovia and saying they wanted to go to school. In two years, I observed these girls struggle with one course per semester or struggle from one place to the other looking for school fees. When the Nobel came, the first thing that came to mind was as we set up this foundation, one of the things that I want to do as my 40th birthday present is to award seven of these girls who were part of the first class of AJWS. Some have graduated and cannot see their way through to college. Others are in college and have left one institution for a cheaper institution because of lack of funding to send them to school. Donors may say, why do you want to spend all that money on one child for eight years? I say, after eight years, when that war, even after the second year of school, when that one child goes back into her community, the motto of our foundation is inspired to empower. She will be the inspiration for girls who want to finish high school. So all of that points to a very powerful faith uh, absolute trust in, in dreams. I have to ask before leaving that question whether you've had any appreciate dreams lately. One of the things, I, I will not call it a dream, it was one of my moments of madness that I was really angry. Angry because I had been working so hard back and forth to get this reconciliation thing off the ground and all I have been getting is bashing. I've come to the place where several times I've said, I'm leaving this thing. You know, I don't want to be a part of it. I, I, I don't know why. I prayed and lie down. And I was asking God, is there a purpose for me now? And all of a sudden, I don't know where this idea came from, but it just came like a shooting thing, our lives for the future. I got up, picked my notepad, and wrote. So that's my newest dream. We're launching a project, not a project, a program in December, where instead of just giving girls scholarship, we're giving these boys scholarship, and we're calling it the Allies for the Future. The idea is that we have all of these girls that have scholarship. We give these boys scholarship, do periodic workshop with them on feminism, on women's rights, on different things, because we want to groom them to be the allies for the future. I have a 14-year-old, she was 13 then, who is a feminist in the making, or has it and is being cultivated. Went to school, talking about today is International Women's Day, boys be nice to us women. And a little boy stand up in the class and say, sit down and shut up. What are women good for but to have babies? Take my case of 1999 and take this young boy who lives in a quote-unquote peaceful community.
country, Ghana, put a gun in his hands, what do you think he's going to do with a woman? He will rape you because all you're good for is making babies. So the question we need to start asking ourselves is how are we socializing these young men that sex is seen as something that you take and that's something that is negotiated. Today the president was like, Lima, we are trying to put programs in, I need your help. How do we tackle this rape thing? And I said to her, Madam President, I am so fed up with projects. I think right now what we need to do is just take conversations into communities with men and boys and really just start talking about the effect of rape, not just on the girl, but on the family, on the community, on the outlook, or even the men in the society. If we can get some of our quote unquote honorable men from the Senate and legislature to join this campaign where we just have a conversation. Because honestly, there's not much we can do. Um, the trade off between work and family. You, you are so almost soul shatteringly honest in this book about that. And I think the women in this room who have families will relate to every single word. Except yours is writ large, it's writ on the world stage. You start early in the book. You say, our children will ask Mama, what was your role in the crisis? And that's something I think that we say every day when we decide whether we're going to be activists or we're going to be passive. We say, you know, things are terrible in our country. What are we going to do? Are we going to just lay back and take it or are we going to do something? But then the other side of it is, what if they ask Mama, where were you when I needed you? And that, I think, is the tension that one feels in reading your book. Could you translate that honesty into this sort of admission in the room? I was at a place this year, and a child asked me, if you had to do your life again, would you spend your time with your children? And my answer was no. And it drew, ah, from the room. And I said, this will sound very brutal and very cold for a mother who professed to love her six children. But you really want to know the truth? Where the path I find myself on is not because of me. It's because of my children. I don't want my daughters to have to constantly apologize in this nation like I have to do on a daily basis for being smart. I don't want my children to grow up in a community where it is acceptable for a woman to be beaten, even though she's a prof professional woman, and pretend that it is all well. I don't want my children to grow up in a place where they're homophobic and pretend that we don't have a problem with gays or we don't have gays in our society. I don't want that. I, will, I want to be out there and speak and speak and speak so that when any of my children are grown up and they decide to live a particular life, even if society doesn't expect it or accept it, they will say, ah, oh, that's Lima's child, you should expect that. I will have laid a foundation for their lives to be easier. It is a painful thing. But what is even more painful is that when I'm old to see them go through the same struggle I went through. So do I regret? I have some regrets. Would I change it? No. I've been taking my daughters to some of our meetings with some of the women and the first eye opener for my 14 year old was at 12 when we went to Sierra Leone and was working with the women in the military. And she sent me this page she had written her thoughts. Why do they treat them like this? They wear the same uniform. They do the same kind of work. Why should they be treated less? Is it because they are women? So over time, they're growing to understand. I know that when there are cases in the US about rape and abuse, the one that lives with Abby now, who told me at a very early age, I would never want to be a peace activist because I want to stay home with my children, engages me. 
What do you think about this? Do you think justice will be served? So I, I feel like we've come to a place where there is an understanding that Mama is doing something good. 